Go makes concurrency easy with Go routines and channels. But what if you want something that feels more like JavaScript or C Sharp? That's exactly what we are going to build today. A simple future type in Go that gives you just async await style programming. Is it really useful and good to have this? Maybe not, but let's just have some fun and learn a few things along the way. In a real world application, you would probably never see this. So let's just get started. Okay, before we get started implementing this async await behavior, I think it's worth mentioning how the API is going to look like. So let's just start with the main function here. And what we're going to do is demonstrate how we actually would use this async await behavior. Now clearly I'm not going to introduce new paradigms into Go, into the language itself. I'm just going to kind of simulate this async await behavior through the functionality of generics and Go's concurrency features. So what we're going to have first is maybe an async function. And this async function just takes in a function parameter and we will call this function, which will be called inside the async function, fetch user data. We are going to create this in a minute here. And then this async function just returns a future. So we are going to say future user, right? And that's it. That's how our async API will look like. Now then we're going to just do some other work and we are going to simulate this with the time.sleep functionality. So what we can say is just fmt.println doing other work while fetching data, right? Because remember, async just fetches the data in the background. Then we have a time.sleep functionality here, and we're going to sleep for 500 milliseconds here. And then we're going to say fmt.println still doing other work, right? Because we are still doing the other work of the async functionality, maybe. And then we're going to call an await function inside of our future. So we're going to say future user dot await. Now this await function just returns the data, right? The resulting data of the call. So this could be user data, for instance, and of course, an error if there is any sort of error. And here we can add another print statement. And then we're going to say waiting for user data to arrive. Right, if there is going to be an error, we're just going to print f this error here. And then if there's no error, we're going to say success. And then we're going to just print the user data. Now, obviously, you can enhance the error handling here inside of the main function, but I'm just going to leave it as it is here. So let's just create this fetch user data function quickly. So fetch user data, and then this is going to return a string and an error, right? So for now, it's just going to return a string. You can enhance this and return a user data struct, for instance, or just real user data if you want to. But for now, we are just going to say user data, and then we say John Doe, for instance, and then the error is nil. Now in here, we are going to simulate some work. So print line and then starting to fetch user data. And then right after it, after sleeping some time, so we're going to say time dot sleep. And then we say two times, let's just say second here, right? So here we are just going to simulate some network latency, obviously some quite heavy network latency. And then we say finished fetching user data. Right? And this is our really simple fetch user data function. So let's just start with the async function implementation. So what we're going to say is func and then async. Now in here, we are going to apply generics. I haven't made a video yet about generics, but I will probably do that really soon. But what we can do here to define a generic parameter is just use these square brackets. And then we say the generic parameter like T for instance, and then we say any. Any is the same, by the way, as interface. It just indicates that it can be any sort of type. And then in here, we can use this generic parameter. And I have actually said that in the API, we are going to pass in a function parameter. So we are just going to say f and then func, right? So the type of the f argument here for our function is func. And then it returns t, which is the generic parameter. So it can be any sort of data and then a possible error. Right, and this is our function parameter definition here. Now what we see in the API itself, it is going to return a future. So let's just say pointer to a future, and then we define here the generic parameter t again. Let's just quickly define this future struct. So we're going to say type future and then t any again, and then struct. Why we can also apply these generics to structs, obviously. And then this future struct just has a function, a lowercase function, which we will call await. And this await is a function which just returns t and a possible arrow again. 
Right, so what is actually going on here? Now inside of the future struct, we actually have a closure that just waits for the result readiness and returns it. And that's basically it for this lowercase await function. Now before I'm going to explain this async function, let's just add a function to the future struct. So we're going to say f and then pointer future and then t. And in here, this is actually the uppercase await. And this returns t and a possible error. And then we are just going to say return f Dot await. And this await just waits until the future completes and returns the result and a possible error. This is just a method that can be called on any kind of future instance. Right, and then we are calling inside of this await function the await closure stored inside of the future. And we are actually going to see what this really means in a minute here when we're going to implement the async logic. But let's just quickly explain the async function signature here. So again, async just starts a function f in a new go routine and returns a future. This future can then be used to really await the result of the function. And you might wonder why do we actually return a pointer to a future here instead of just the value? Now in Go, structs that represent a unique session resource or basically just ongoing operation. This can be a future, a database connection or like a file handle. And these are almost always passed and returned as pointers. This just signals to the user of the API that they are dealing with a handle to something, not a simple copyable value. Also copying to a future doesn't really make logical sense because you want to refer to the same single asynchronous operation. Furthermore, if we would ever decide to add state directly to the future struct. Now this can be for instance a sync.1 state to cache the result and to make repeated await calls more efficient, returning by value just would break the code here. So each copy would just have its own state, which really then defeats the purpose. And that's why we are going to use a pointer here to a future. All right, now with that in mind, we can actually say var and then result t, right? Remember, t is just any sort of type. And then we are also going to declare the error here. Now we're just going to declare these two variables here to just store the results for the future. Now then what we're going to do, let's just quickly return the value here or the future in this case, which will be future. And then we define the generic type here, which is t. And in here, we are going to apply this await function. And this is just the function, right, which just returns t and an error. And in here, we are going to return result and error, right? This is how the return value actually looks like for the async function. And now we need to populate these two resulting values here. But before we continue with that, thank you so much, Savala, for sponsoring this video. Savala is the true all-in-one platform as a service that just allows you to deploy apps, databases, and static sites without really dealing with complex infrastructure. The best part is that there are no annoying artificial limits, so no restrictions on parallel builds, no caps on team members, and of course you only pay for what you use. They run on Google Kubernetes engine across 25 regions with Cloudflare Global Network for speed and reliability. Additionally, they provide support from real human developers who understand your problems, which can be incredibly helpful. Furthermore, the developer experience is just seamless. You can push to Git, receive automatic builds, enjoy instant previews and benefit from one-click templates. Whether you're building the next big app or just want some reliable hosting for your site projects, Savala handles it all and scales with you. They are offering new users $50 in free credits to get started, so feel free to check out the link in the description. Again, thank you so much to Savala for sponsoring this video. Now, let's just get back to the code. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a channel first and we are going to use the make function and in here we're going to say channel and then empty struct. Right, this just creates a channel to signal when the work is actually done. And shan and struct in this case just uses an empty struct because we only care about signaling. And in this case, make just creates the channel for that. Right, this struct definition is just a zero size type. So it's the most efficient choice when you just want to notify completion, for instance. It's just a primary way to communicate and synchronize between Go routines in Go. All right, cool. Then we're going to just call a go routine here, right? So we're going to run the provided function f in this case in a separate go routine, which just enables this concurrent execution. And in here, we are just going to execute f and obviously f returns t and an error. So we can say result error is equal to f. 
So we will store the results of the executing f function inside of the result and the error. So in here we are just going to run the actual work. But somehow we also need to make use of this done channel. Because right now we don't really know if this go function completed or not. So what we can say is just defer and then close and then we are going to say done here. So we are closing the done channel. Right, and when the goroutine finishes here, we are just going to close the done channel to signal completion to any waiting await calls. Defer in this case just means run this when the function exits. That's basically it. Right, then we are done with this goroutine implementation here. Now again, this future just returns immediately. So we are going to immediately return this future even before the work is done. And inside the await function here, we are just going to wait until the done channel has been closed, right? So with this logic, we are basically waiting until the done channel is closed and this just blocks or kind of pauses until the go routine finishes. So the general flow is that we first write the result and error, then we close the channel we receive the close here and then return the values. This is the basic workflow here. And with that, we are kind of done. So if we are going to run this program, what we'll actually see is that we are doing some other work, right? Then we are starting to fetch the user data. We are actually waiting for the user data to arrive here, right? Because here we are calling the dot await function. And then it says finished fetching user data, right? It returns the user data. And then we just print the user data here. Just to recap what is going on here. Again, the async function just starts the fetch in the background, right? If we just hop into this function, we are declaring a new done channel. Then we're going to declare this new go routine in the background. And here is where the work basically happens for the function we pass into the async function. So in this case, it will actually start the fetch user data function right here inside of this go routine. And whenever this is done, we're going to close the channel. In this case, we are signaling that the work has been done. However, we are also returning immediately a future struct. And inside this future struct, we have an await closure. Now this await closure is just an anonymous function that just captures and references variables from the surrounding lexical scope of the async function. So in this case, it just captures the done channel, the result and the error, right? And whenever this closure is called, which will be the case whenever we call this publicly available await function of the future, right? Remember, it will call actually this function here, which will be defined in the struct definition. We will then wait until the done channel has been closed and then we are going to return the result and an error. So this right here is kind of a blocking operation whenever we call this function. So hopefully this makes sense for you, but we are not done yet because we can kind of enhance the error handling of the async await behavior here. So what we can do is just simulate a worker that just panics, right? Worker that panics. And this just returns a string and an error again. Here we're going to say fmt print line, right? Just some information here. Then we're going to sleep for 300 milliseconds. And then we're going to panic. Now this is an intentional panic just for the demo here. And clearly everything after this panic is just unreachable. So we do not need to return anything here, right? This right here is just unreachable code. Okay, so what if we actually call this inside of the main function? So we're going to say future and then we're going to say async worker that panics, right? So we are actually starting the worker that will panic in the background. And then we are awaiting. So future dot await. And then we're going to use this error handling here again. So if there is any sort of error, we're just going to print the error here. And if it was successful, we are just going to say success and we say value. All right, pretty cool. So let's just run this program again. And what we will actually see is a panic. And this actually ends the program, which is not really good for this async await behavior. Because maybe we want to recover this panic and we want to kind of handle it in the background or use it somewhere else, right? So as you can see, this fmt.printf is never really executed in here because we have a worker that will just panic and just crash the program entirely. So let's just fix this by going inside of the async function and then we can defer a new function here. 
Right in here in the end, we're just going to close the done channel again. This is really important to actually signal the completion. Now I'm just going to demonstrate that we could add a recover here to really convert the panic into an error value and can then return it without really crashing the process. And converting panics to errors just may hide bugs. So use this carefully here. But for some applications, you might prefer the program to crash during development. So bugs are actually noticed. Okay, so what we can do here is we can recover so we are going to call the recover function and then if r is not equal to nil right so here we are going to recover from the panic and then in there we are going to set the error so recover in this case just returns the value passed to the panic or nil if there was no panic at all. And then in here, we're going to apply a switch statement. Now it's important to highlight here that panics can carry any sort of value. Most likely it is an error, but sometimes it can be also a string or another type. And we need to kind of handle this here with this switch on the dynamic type in this case to preserve error semantics when possible. So we're going to say switch and then we're going to say type to actually kind of get the type of R in this case. And then we say case error. So if it is of type error, we are going to say error FMT dot error F. And then in here, we are just going to say panic in worker percent W backslash N and then percent S. Right in here, we're just going to set the error value instead of panicking. And then we're going to say X and debug.stack. So what's actually going on here? Again, if the panic payload is already an error, we are just going to wrap it with this percent %W to preserve it as a course. This just allows the callers to use errors.is or errors.as on the error itself. And then we are also attaching a stack trace via debug.stack to really show where the panic originated. Now, if the recovered panic payload is not an error, so for instance, a string, we actually need to format it with percent %v. So we say default here and we say error is equal to fmt.errorf panic in worker percent %v and then percent %s. Here we're going to say x again and then debug.stack, right? Always close the channel here. So await can actually proceed even if f panics or the function argument in this case panics. So the receivers will proceed. And then we are done handling the recover mechanics of panics here, right? And if we now run this program again here, we will actually see that we are recovering this panic, right? So what we see is the stack trace here, and then obviously the panic in worker, something went horribly wrong. And then we also have this error prefix, right? So we can actually note that this line is run here. We can actually check this again by just saying awaited error. And then let's just run this program again. And what we actually see is that this line is run and we see awaited error here, panic in worker. And that's pretty nice and pretty helpful. Now it's important to note here as well that we do not really handle cancellation and timeouts here. So we do not really use the context module. Now real network calls must support cancellation so the caller can then cancel waiting and stop the work entirely. I will actually show you in a separate video how we can actually apply the context module to this code here. And that was it. Hopefully you've learned a few things in this video. If you also want to have a crash course about basic concurrency in Go, feel free to check out this video here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.